so the company is called Yon Consulting, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that. It's not really not a plug for them, but they enabled me to be here. And if you want to find this talk, at the bottom there's a bit.ly link. I won't track you, don't mind, but don't worry. But it's just PyCon ZA notebook, but I'll give you the link to the GitHub repo a bit later. So what are we going to talk about today? Maybe just some background on the notebook itself. A little bit of plotting, interactive plotting, doing symbolic, symbolic type maths. Touching on pandas, we used pandas here before. That's super awesome as well. Um, <laughs> it's almost a drop-in replacement for Excel. Then I'll just show you, I'm not a machine learning guy, but I'm going to sh show you a pretty neat machine learning example just to see a feel for the graphics around that. And then I'll show you how you can publish some of this work. So a lot of the work that I do is doing some interactive work. I'm not a developer, I'm not a coder. My scripts only run once, and then they're done. But I don't have to be pretty. I don't really care what you think about my code. If I get the answer, um, I'm fine with that. Who am I? I'm an electrical engineer. I like to think of myself as a hacker, um, but I'm probably more of an engineer than a hacker. I don't break everything open I see. I'm very busy with my M, and I use Python quite a bit in my M. I'll show you an example um, of where we use it. I'm using it to solve some thermodynamic um, questions regarding hot water storage and production. I'm a principal consultant at Eon Consulting. We're a management consulting firm, so I think the Lloyd's think is just a miniature version of that. Some of our clients is City Power. I'm doing a nice job at uh, Ikurileni now, which is very data heavy. I'm getting terabytes data sizes sets. I've done some work at Newtel in the good old days. I'm agnostic in terms of platforms. <laughs> I'm comfortable using Windows. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, it's a business requirement, and there's some, there's some merit in that. Ubuntu on my own PC is the one in my bar, and I use the Mac for things like this. And then also, I use Android and iPhone, so I, they all have their issues. I prefer some of them to the others, but that's probably not for today. People at my work use Excel a lot, but big time. <laughs> guys are addicted to it. They're like, they cannot understand this workflow of exploring data and writing it down so that people can change it. Why must you hide it in if statements, drag it down? <laughs> you want to change the model? I took over a model from my boss, who is a super Excel guru, and I'll never diss him. He's a really, really clever economist, and he's world-renowned for the stuff he does, and he does solely in Excel. Still a great tool, but every line you have to go through and see what was multiplied. That multiply you can't change somewhere. It's a constant or a variable. You have to go through it. There's 40 of those sheets, and so we transferred it to Python. It worked beautifully, but the company said, we don't like this Python, it sounds silly. And then they read it, it came from Monty Python. Oh, no, no, a bunch of <laughs> 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 So I'm alone, I'm alone in this journey in my company, but slowly but surely I convinced them to be here. They're buying me a nice server um, in the next few weeks where we can start doing some of this stuff. And hopefully we'll make small changes from, from within. This talks in Python 2.7. A lot of the scientific stuff is only now being fully ported. So I don't really care what Python version I use. For me, the only difference where I stand is just the brackets in the print statement, really. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Python is popular. You know this. You're going to see slides like this all over the show. Um, we know it's popular. It's being used by everybody. Uh, Google, YouTube, Dropbox. A lot of people didn't even know. I think that Dropbox clients and Windows are written in Python. They're busy porting it, I believe. So, yes, it's used everywhere, but practically, uh, one of the users that I'm using it for is in my M where we say that water can be stored in a tank and that tank has some losses in terms of pipe losses. The tank itself due to its area has a lot out and you're also using water from there. You can supply it, sorry if you want to see it, but there's a geezer, a solar water geezer that also a heat pump that supply heat into this tank for the system. And if you have a model that represents it, you can calibrate some sort of model, the red flag being the model and the blue being the actual. Once you're happy with that, you can take some longer term weather data, which is going to match the Cape Town, I think. And you can compare these two technologies over a year period. You can see um, how they perform, and most of that was done in Python and using Matplotlib. So we do use it, and this one, we actually got paid for the work. So that's quite cool. So why, why would we use Python in, in data analytics? I'm not sure who is primarily more interested in data analysis and not necessarily development. Okay, so, so for us it's, it's important to get a workflow. I mean, the Python, a couple of years ago, it was R, mostly R, MATLAB, and those languages. Today, Python is really coming through. It's almost like the 100 meter where the third guy or the last horse, it seems to, it's going to probably come past soon. 
So hardcore art guides, nothing wrong with that. These things are tested, tried. Nothing wrong with that. I just find it a bit obscure to use, but I use it every now and then. But Python is multi-purpose. You can use it everywhere. Um, I can use it to do data analysis. If I then want to put that data analysis in a web server, I can do that. There's libraries for everything. I don't know, you saw that joke the guy that had to write the essay at school, he just said, import essay. That was it, okay? <laughs> it's efficient in terms of code production, so it's easy for us to write code and write it quickly. Performance, not always the quickest. The performance game is in terms of writing it quickly, but with the newer CUDA and NVIDIA graphics cards, being able to talk for Python run code straight on the GPUs and stuff like that is really getting fast, and I'm getting a big NVIDIA CUDA processor for my server, and I'm very happy about that. It's interoperable, so it runs everywhere. Um, I've tested this presentation on all three Mac, Windows, and Linux. There's one or two glitches, it was just libraries that might be installed on the other machine, so um, that's the only issue. And sometimes in the notebook, a couple of the CSS elements not showing properly in, in the browser. It's interactive, so you'll see today, after this boarding bit, we'll do a bit of interactive stuff. And we can collaborate now with Continuum Analytics, we know them. Similar to Thought, awesome two companies that's bringing us scientific tools with a one-click installer. You don't have to compile that part, you don't have to worry about all the independence and stuff I can do from my perspective. Some of you would love to be in the terminal for hours, sometimes you just have to get it working. If you, I think it's called Wakari, you can sign up for a free account and have a notebook in the cloud there. The Python science stack obviously consists of Python, which is the base interpreter, NumPy, which is a high performance array, was done by the Continuum guys, Willifant, what's his name? Uh, Travis Willifant. I think it was part of his PhD, still a student in this thing just took off, because there weren't a high performance flexible array for, for, for Python. You've got the SciPy, which is more a stack for regression, optimization, integration, symbolic math, and stuff like that. Pandas, which is, for me, the, the one I use the most, which is time series, which is really, no, not more Excel, we're just using Pandas. My tables, I haven't used that too much, but if your database gets too big, you can do out of memory swapping um, with my tables. Matplotlib is getting a bit old now, still functional. Everybody uses it, but there's some serious competition. Why at the guys has got reporting GGU plot 2. I've used that and it's really, really awesome. So the R guys have used GGU plot 2. It's coming. Then IPython, which we're using today. And just to put, um, get the full picture, Python is running in the background, IPython is running, and it's connected to this web browser via kernel, and it's talking a little bit, JSON Bob's back and forth, so everything you see here is actually running as a live Python um, session. I'm not going to talk too much about the IPython, just in terms of the basics of this notebook. I mean, the notebook itself is awesome, you can do code execution in it, so anything you can run in the terminal, you can run in here. You can type in text, you'll see this is text. You can have mathematics, and mathematics will be rendered. It'll show that the data math jacks will render your text type um, stuff for you. Plots, you can have the plots in here, interactive plots. And it's been used at Berkeley, where I think some of this started with uh, Fernando and the guys. They use this to actively teach their programming classes. And when, since I've done this, it's just a whole mushrooming of everybody's using it. Every single PyCon conference the past two years, 80% of the talks were done in the iPython notebook like this. It's also an easy talk to do because visually it's pleasing and people like to see pictures and you can get away with the murder. <laughs> um, you've got code completion, you get access to the help system, you can have markdown cells, which this one is. If I right double click it for you, um, you will see this is the markdown of that cell. And if I run it, it renders it back into HTML real patch more or less. Cool, some helpful commands when you're in IPython itself, you can use the question mark to bring up IPython's features list. We'll show that now. You can use the percentage quick ref just to get some quick reference. We'll just demonstrate that quickly. You can type help, normally as you would do with any interpreter. And then you can use the object with a question mark, which is very similar to the R object, um, getting information. A single question mark will bring back the doc string. We'll show that. Two question marks will bring back the actual function definition if it's available. So we're almost busy, almost at the end of the boarding, but we're going to get a bit more interactive now. So let's get started. Each cell is populated with Markdown or Python code. In this case, you would see it is Markdown. I think I showed it one too early, but again, here's the Markdown for that cell. To run a cell, you press Shift Enter, it will just stay where it is. Control Enter, it will run the next cell. 
if you press Control MH, you will see the shortcuts um, you could use. And at any point, even if the kernel is busy or hung, if you press Control S, you can save your. One thing that happened to me yesterday: I used cat, and I didn't cat it to a file, and I accidentally cat it 800 million lines of, of text into the cell. So the notebook became about 400 megabytes. Size, I could never open it again. So that, luckily, it's a text file, so you can physically go and remove that. <coughs> right, so I'm not sure if you can see this, but this is a typical code cell. Uh, don't assume you're stupid, but this thing has been shown to um, introductory classes as well. So, therefore, we say create and set a variable to four. I know you know this, but if I reuse it, then I don't have to retype it. So, basically, what it says it says hello to you. And it just points out the subtle issues in Python to not dividing by, by zero. And that you have to explicitly find a variable like that a float. Otherwise, you'll get an integer back. But the code actually ran in the cell. So, using the help system, if you run the percentage quick ref function with shift enter, you will get a little, little pop up screen there that will tell you a little bit more about IPython and some of its. Some of its functions. Code completion and introspection. So in the next cell, I will just define a stupid two functions with a long name. Um, and I'll show you with a question mark how you can get a doc string, and with two question marks how you can get the function definition. And I'll show you how the autocomplete uh, function works. So here we define a long, silly, dummy name with a doc string, and I think it has some math on it. We then define it again, just giving a separate name. Once I run this, it will be committed to the namespace. So what I'm just doing at the end here, I'm just looking for the word silly in the namespace. So using the data command, you can get all the, all the functions and variables in the namespace. And I'm just looking for anything with the word silly in it. Just to prove that it was actually committed uh, to the current namespace. Cool. So it's found long silly name and long silly name two in the namespace. So it's been, the code has actually ran. In the next cell, you can type a question mark and see the doxing of that function I defined come in the body. It doesn't work for functions that was compiled from Fortran and some of the scientific things, but if it's a Python, if the Python of EUI file is there, you will find it. Then if you use two question marks, you would actually get the code that was used uh, to get that specific function, generate that function. Auto-completion also works, so there's almost two Go. So you could by pressing tab as you would normally do in the iPad, you would definitely be able to select one of those with this time it's a function. Okay, and you can also run that function normally and that five five six. So it just gives you a bit of an idea of how the exactness works here. Can everybody see at the back? Like it's probably a bit blurry. The project is not that sharp. Using markdown, I think I've said this a couple of times, you can use a markdown cell. And basic markdown, you can define headings, you can even define a table, and I put some few photos, a few pictures, images inside that table. This becomes very important when you're writing maybe a scientific paper or even a research report. So you would be publishing your whole analysis, all the text, all the work. I've done this once, it looks super awesome. I had custom LaTeX generation, all that stuff, and the client said they wanted it in Word. So, you know, that unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> it's a couple of four letter words. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, IPython itself has some magics. They call it magic commands. It's probably more like a macro. You can run a, a magic on a line using a percentage, um, a percentage sign, or a cell magic using a double percentage. You can just type in magics and the command you'll get a list of all of them. One that I will demonstrate that, that I find handy is the time it magic. I think it's available in any case. But it just shows you how long a piece of code is taking to, to complete and it shows you milliseconds per loop. Now the first function I'm just using, I'm just saying I want to time the next cell and I'm doing a couple of iterations and taking the power two twice. It takes a little bit of time it tells you 20.3 milliseconds of the 10 loops, um, and the best one is number three. 
Uh, in the next one, I've just removed one of those lines, so it should run a little bit quicker. The weirdest thing, the answer takes longer to come back, but it did take 10.1 milliseconds. We are s actively trying to figure out why that is. Ah, because the second one took 100 leaps, the first one took 10 leaps. Cool. So, yes. Thank you very much. I don't know how we missed that, but it's still... <laughs> See, it helps to come to conferences. You can run cell commands. Now, this is not a feature of the notebook itself. You, are you the guy that did intro math in the previous session? Did you find... Yeah. You're the guy. Yes. I should have just double-checked when you walked in and asked you to leave. <laughs> <laughs> You're the type of guy that you want in a presentation. <laughs> oh, well done for picking that up. So, the good thing about IPython is this whole idea that you can use it as a drop-in selling place. I use it as my, my, sh my shell now. And just by appending the exclamation mark in front of a command, you can actually run a shell command. If you're going to run nano or uh, vim or whatever you use as your text editor, so I just gave away what I use, um, then, <laughs> then, uh, then you're going to have an issue. So anything that's uh, curses related or something like that um, you will be, have an issue. But you can run your alerts and pop and move. I'll show you a quick example of that. Um, in the next snippet, I just create a file list by saying, <coughs> show me the directory listing in the static image um, folder. <coughs> and I just create a dictionary, I just count through them, and I just see, looking at the extension of that file, I'm just counting the extensions. So there's a PowerPoint file in there, sorry. There's a JSON file, some weird DB file that I don't know what it is. One JPEG and a couple of things. And that is the images that's actually embedded into the presentation. Embedding images, you, uh, as part of the markdown, you can embed an image by using the normal HTML image tag, which is not very Pythonic, but you can do that. A bit more Pythonic way would be to use the IPython image uh, function from the display module, and you can display that image uh, like that as well. You can add a YouTube video. So similar, you would import the, import the YouTube video, and if I'm connected now, this is one of Fernando, the guy that created this, one of his first iPython talks. I'm not going to press play now. Cool, so plotting, I think that's where it starts getting a bit more interactive. So in versions up to number one of Python, there were no real room for interactive plotting. It's changed, and I'll show you some of the static plots in terms of Matplotlib, and then we'll get into a bit more interactive. There's one or two what we call crowd teasers at the end. <laughs> this is a simple function. I don't have to really go through it in detail, but we create an array, and then we distribute some numbers in that array, and we plot, we scatter it, um, we do a bar chart, I think it's even a line chart. So just that piece of that snippet would actually create interact in those, those plots. Another example would be um, that you can combine plots. So the next code snippet would, code snippet would create two plots, and it would combine it. Um, and you would have a plot within a plot. This one just zooming in around the onit origin there just to show you what's going on there. You would see, and I'll show a bit more of that, you can use the LaTeX type markup, and it would use, it would then render that math as MathJax. Not MathJax, it would be rendered properly on the, on the image itself. We can add text to a plot. Um, again, we'll be similar previous one and by changing the font size probably make it a bit bigger. Let's make it 500, I want to see what that is. <laughs> right. So it didn't actually make the text bigger, it made the plot smaller. Okay, but interact I think that's the proof. I mean interactively you can play with these things and you don't have to redo really a lot of it. Um, some, I don't know, some weird dude, there's always a dude, <laughs> there's always that guy that would like to just port everything and, and there's also now a XKCD plotting style available to make problem. So here's a, here's a little bit of a, a code snippet that creates the following two um, plots and you only have to do, we just have to say with plot of XKCD and then just transform it. So, um, did I run it now? So like I said, there's always that guy. So the first part is really just saying that his overall health compared to the day he realized that you could put bacon whenever you wanted. It's uh, happened to many of us. And then uh, this one is quite interesting. The, the claims of supernatural <laughs> powers confirmed and 
computer for experiment. <laughs> Quite interesting that now that we have cell phone devices all over the world, there are very little photos of UFOs coming through. Remember yeah, in the old days? They were everywhere, now they're nowhere. <laughs> symbolic map? Um, who uses symbolic map? You're studying still. Something you probably use a more when you're studying. Or you're trying to show people fancy equations. I do that when I'm in a bar on my own. I like a napkin and I write in the and stuff like that. I don't know what they do, but I, I hope people think I'm clever. <laughs> and I really do that. I mean, it's not a joke. Um, <laughs> so here you would define and expand the exponential function in its series. It even does a little bit of the O notation. You could also define an equation that would be x plus y to the power of 2 times x plus 1. And if you just want to pretty print that, you can just have a look at what that looks like. So that will show you nicely what that looks like. You can also ask, ask you to solve that. There's something wrong with my formatter, but it, at least it gives you the answers. I tried to do special formatting for the presentation, and I think I broke it. But anyways, the answer of that is x minus 1 and x minus y. Um, here's another function, uh, something I stole from the internet, like most of the presentation. Um, you can simplify that, and it simplifies the selection. Sometimes doing that by hand is just a labor stock, except to you. <laughs> you are probably the lookup table that is on the internet that this <laughs> search is for. <laughs> Alright, you can, you can ask it to integrate x to the power of 2 times the exponent of x times cos of x over x. This takes a while, e even for you, sir. Um, <laughs> <laughs> takes about 5 or 6 seconds. But that, that is quite a difficult one to integrate. If you, you would have to look at tables and stuff like that, you see what the answer is. It's quite a, quite a heavy thing. Okay, so pandas. So we all love pandas. Uh, where's McKinney there? Where's, where's with this guy that works in finance? I think he got frustrated with Excel just keep on breaking with larger data sets and not being vectorized for those of you that um, work with large sets of data. Vectorization means that you don't have to in the old days, we would actually iterate over an array and then in line change every single value, index it. Remember Pascal? For i equals 10, then the array index it, and then get the value, answer it, and then write it back. Now you just say array times 2, and it, would, it knows it just needs to multiply every single value with that. So what Pandas does is really gives us that. It's a one and a two dimensional array that added a panel so you can do four dimensional data with it. But I struggle to think lot further than three dimensions um, and you should too. <laughs> so for us the data frame is really a drop-in replacement uh, for the R data frame. Who's R here? So R data frame is the thing. If R didn't have the data frame, R would be dead. But the most powerful thing in R is that awesome data frame. You can do some awesome stuff with it. And this is Python's way of trying to, to get into that playing field. And it's doing it very, very well. And I believe it's faster, but I'm not going to get into that right now. So, a quick example of pandas. Um, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to read into a data frame a CSV file that has all the Cape Town 2009 min and max temperatures and some um, solar radiation. And then I'm just going to show you the head, the first 10 entries. Okay, so just read a CSV file. We put it in a data frame. The data frame is now accessible and you can do a lot of awesome stuff with it. And I'll show you a couple of that, those things now. You can plot it. So just by calling that variable and the high dot plot and the cape weather dot low dot plot, um, you can plot the values in there. So it's really easy. You don't have to physically know what's in the data. You would see that it is indexed with a dot notation, but nothing stops you from putting square brackets and putting it as text when you have spaces. You cannot do that if you're because people will give you data with spaces in the name because they don't know that you want to do this. And people love spaces. File names everywhere, they just want to put spaces. <laughs> underscores are, I don't know, the seems in conferences like this, people are comfortable using an underscore. In real life, people are really scared of the underscore. <laughs> All right, so that data file that I read in, the first two lines had 365 values for the year. The third column only had 12 values, which is the mean radiation for, um, for each month. And what I'm going to do there is I'm just going to plot radiation, but only the first 12, the first 12 values, just to show you some indexing on the data frame as well, which give us the mean solar radiation in Cape Town. 
So just a question, it's quite interesting. What city in South Africa has the lowest mean solar radiation per year? I'll give you options. Durban, Joburg, Cape Town. Okay, so it's Durban. It's, just, it's hot there, it's humid there, there's a lot of cloud cover all the time, so the solar radiation is an issue. So just from the research perspective, the heat pump works very, very well in Durban, because of ambient temperature. It works very, very well in summer here, but not in winter, because we have low ambient temperatures in winter. Uh, but we have massive, and very high radiation, so solar water heat is a bit more friendly here. Except we have a lot of hail, which is another issue. Right, so if you want to query that data frame, um, what I'm going to just look for, this becomes important, I don't know if some of you have been in H, HVAC or 10 minutes, I'm more sure. You want to just have a look at what, how many days you have more than 25 degrees and less than 25 degrees. Yeah, we go look at the data set, we say Cape Town weather, where Cape Town weather high is higher than the level, count that for me and show me um, the results. So that would show me that there's 59 days um, that is warmer than 35, which makes Cape Town really a shit place to stay. <laughs> um, and I'm from Cape Town, so I've been, I've been on both sides. This state's awesome to go there. Waterfront's great, all the other places, but there's the mountain on your left and you come back. <laughs> then you can do basic statistics on this. You can describe it, and you would see that there are 365 values in the high and the low, and there are 12 values in the radiation with its mean, standard deviation, its minimum, and some of the bins. You can, this is actually quite cool. You can run a SQL query using SQLite on this data frame. So you could say there's a helper function um, that just looks at globals. So from the globals, it will just look at where's the data <coughs> frames. And you run this query. You could say select the count of the high, call it count, uh, what is high minus low, call it T spread. From the weather, from, you just call it whatever the variable name is. You would go and find it. And you would say where it's higher than 25 and lower than 10, and show that to me. So there's three days with a large temperature spread in Cape Town. That also becomes important for some guys designing their conditions. Um, just an example of a box plot or histogram. Type settings on the tech. I'm just going to show you one or two so you could review it written on the tech. So let's vote. Lat tech? Lat tech? Latex. 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 <laughs> All right, you see why we just say we print some math. <laughs> okay? So it would render that. So what's happened here is it would render it, send it to MathJax, MathJax would render it and send it back to the browser. Here's, here's one that I, I draw on the napkin. I don't know what the hell this is. It really looks awesome. There's some cross products in there. All that stuff. Can you please tell us what that is? <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually not sure. <laughs> Wait, can I close <laughs> then you can save this whole thing as a, as a you can save it in pastebin. So just saying, um, pastebin cell 1, I call it cell 1, 0 to 10. If you go to that URL now, you'll find the first 10 cells values in there. To move on quickly, you can connect to this kernel remotely. If you're on the same network than me and you type in this information, you'll be able to get into this kernel. It's not, it's not um, secure at the moment. You'll be able to get code into the kernel. Please don't. Um, then interactivity, I think this is where it's a little bit better. What this code does is, it's, I don't know who here works with networks, network representation, social media analysis. You get a couple of views, lobsters and clusters, and Ardos, Renyi, and Newman, Watts, all these type of uh, network generators. And if you, if you wanted to draw one of them, you have to physically go and draw it, and you have to put in the parameters that you want at that specific time. So that's silly, because every time you want to change it, you're going to have to go and rerun that function. So from IPython 2, I believe, they've added this interact function that just wrapped that function that you created and you provide some limits to it. Uh, let me show you what the output of that is. So we can change here. And you can change even the generator that it used. So it gives you a little bit more of the, let's call it the Python of the Excel pivot table type activity if you really have to press your boss. Um, I think there's another one. So this one just draws some random scatters and you can change the size, change the color, and uh, you can link to other 
And this is actually the, the nicer one to show. You can link to other um, notebooks. This one shows the Lorentz differential equations. I used to know them a while back, but uh, it's a very, very long time ago. It was only for one day. Um, <laughs> that's the day you write the exam on it. But to solve this is really heady. Um, Python really solves this really easy using numerical methods. And again, if you want to plot it, um, it will give you an, a plot. But it, again, there's angles and some steps involved. And again, if you wrap it into interactive, this one really leads itself to do some really cool visualization. Digital, cool you can change some of the parameters. It was very, very difficult when you study this, is looking at a 3D. And this is really when you start spinning it around its axis. It really becomes very cool. The first time this was shown at PyCon 2012, people were on their chairs clapping. <laughs> it was something really new uh, for the Python community. MATLAB has had that for, for years apparently. Yes. So just a quick machine learning example. Uh, the next the next bit of code just generates some random random data. I wanted to show it to you like this actually. So I'm not solving it. I'm just generating two sets of random data, and you will see there's this blue plot with some of the residual scattered around the red plot, red plot, and red stuff. So you want a machine learning algorithm that will figure that out. The one that is used here is called Adaboost. Adaboost was developed by I think NASA. Some of the guys there. No, the guys that's looking for the quarks and stuff. What do you call again? Um, so, so guys at CERN, as part of the just before the Large Hadron Collider, the smaller one, which is actually quite very big as well. They developed this one, um, and if you, if I just add solve there, oh, sorry, the crew, then what the machine learning algorithm would do, and this is actually very neat. It actually chunked out. Uh, just looking at the data, I found the pattern in there. Not without errors, but incredible that it could, could actually do that. So from machine learning, who's into pattern recognition, which is the old name for it. Love to speak to you more. It's a field that really, I really um, like, but I don't know too much about it. The very basic pattern matching. It used to be pattern matching, yeah? Now it's machine learning. It's, it's a lot cooler you get drops when you say that. <laughs> All right, if you want to publish your work, just finishing up quickly. Um, if you run this command, ipython and convert, convert, you can say, put it to slides for me and serve it. What it would do is it would convert this whole notebook, um, hopefully, into presentation. Open up a browser. And now it's more of a static um, reveal.js type presentation. Just be careful not to, at the end, embed itself on itself. <laughs> so you can embed a web page, you can embed it just for, it does that for four iterations and then it complains. So most of the stuff, most of the stuff would be there. Cool. Um, the next one does the same, it just says that it's, it's, it's pure HTML. What's happened now, the kernel is now locked, so I have to go out and kill the kernel, so I can't run this at the moment, but it should serve you pure, pure HTML. Right, so people are writing books, just finishing up, people are writing books, and if you want to see a really cool example, you can go and have a look at probabilistic programming and Bayesian methods for actually <coughs> a proper full book that's been written in Python and the notebook. Thank you, so thank you for your time. If you want to find out more, um, all of this is there by the Bitly link. Please join us at the Gauteng Python user group. Myself, uh, I think the same would be here, Walter must be here. He's here, we, we do get together every now and then have a couple of Python courses. Um, we on Meetup there. We have group, Google Groups there. We have a website there. We're on GitHub. We've made sure we're everywhere before we came here. <laughs> and then we do a Python course. It's, it's not non-profit. We do ask a small fee for a day for Python introduction. There's one for Python data analysis. We would do some of this. And we work on a Python for kids. One way that's interesting is waiting for one of your schools and you can find more there. Thank you.